Welcome to the next video in the mathematical logic sequence, talking about propositional logic, and in this video, normal forms. So this will be a first video where uh, uh, we're talking about both, right, the interaction between syntax and semantics. Uh, the normal form of a sentence, or, or the normal form of a formula will be a formula, so that is very sort of syntaxy but we will be able to construct it by way of the truth table for the formula, and that means that we're, we're using the semantics, and so we're seeing a kind of interplay between them. And really already by the point we're talking about models, we're talking about the model of a form, right, like applied to a formula, so that's already an interaction, but anyway. Okay, so to introduce the idea of a disjunctive normal form, I'll just start off with an example right away. So this formula here is already in what we call disjunctive normal form. And the reason why that counts as disjunctive normal form is because its main operator is a bunch of disjunctions. Now I say a bunch, here there's only one, but in general we could have many disjunctions, right? Uh, just about, yeah, really any uh, number of disjunctions would be acceptable. We would still call it disjunctive normal form as long as these main operators are disjunctions. I'll be more rigorous about this in a minute, but I just want to give you the intuition for now. Now, what you are disjoining, each formula that you disjoin in this long disjunction, potentially, must itself be some conjunction. As many conjunctions as you want, but it is some conjunction, right? And only made up of conjunctions, basically, right? Uh, again, speaking somewhat non-rigorously here. So you're conjoining a bunch of other formulae. Now, what are those formulae? They must be what I will call negatomics. The textbook calls them literals, but negatomics to me sounds cute. And uh, so anyway, what is it? It is either an atomic sentence or a negated atomic, uh, sorry, I keep saying for sentence, but I mean formula. So it's either an atomic formula or a negated atomic formula. And so here is the more rigorous and abstract uh, definition of a disjunctive normal form. So a formula is in disjunctive normal form if it is phi 1 disjunction, phi 2 disjunction, as many as you like, disjunction phi m for some non-negative integer m uh, or positive integer m. And each phi i, right, with i ranging between 1 and m, each phi i is some conjunction psi with a subscript, right? Don't worry too much about the details of the subscript. It's really fairly meaningless. There's just some, like, technical machinery going on there to ensure that I have enough sort of, like, ability to choose new formula, formulae, uh, for each of the phi i's, but anyway, so the, the, the details are not terribly important if they're not, if it's not clear why they're there, then just don't worry about it. But it's just some conjunction of a bunch of formulae, and those formulae must be uh, negatomics. So each psi sub whatever must be a negatomic. I do want to point out that DNFs are not unique, right? So if you start from a, a formula, right? The idea, by the way, is not just to be able to say whether a sentence is already in disjunctive normal form. We will be talking in a moment about how to take a given sentence, even if it is not in disjunctive form, and what we will be interested in is finding some equivalent sentence which is in disjunctive normal form. So the next point that I want to make is that the disjunctive normal form is not unique. And what I mean by that is that you may have many disjunctive normal form formulae, all equivalent to each other. And so I have on the slide here a, the example from the previous slide, and I'm pointing out that it is in fact equivalent to this other sentence, P1 conjunction negation P2, and that is in disjunctive normal form. And you may think that that doesn't quite look like disjunctive normal form because there is no disjunction, but technically this does count as just disjunctive normal form because we allow the number of disjuncts to be one. So when that happens, you just don't see the disjunction symbol at all. This is an edge case, so maybe you have to kind of like define it 
uh, in its own special way or something like that. Uh, but in any case, technically, we do allow this to count in our definition of disjunctive normal form. So uh, the next thing to talk about is then how to take a given sentence and construct its disjunctive normal form, which means that we're actually constructing some other formula, but that other formula will be in disjunctive normal form and equivalent to the one we started with. I am displaying here a, uh, a kind of an algorithm, right? So for instance, right, the, basically a conjunction needs to be handled in its own special way. A, uh, a contradiction, its disjunctive normal form just is the sentence by, or uh, false. But if it's not a contradiction, then it has some, right, if you, if you sort of like actually write out the the tabular version of the truth table of a sentence, of this sentence phi. Since it's not a contradiction, some row of that truth table will take the value true, and we can use that row to construct a particular conjunction, right? This is going to be, right, we'll use the row to construct that particular phi i, which will be a, you know, conjunction of a bunch of psi's, every psi a negatomic. We'll see exactly the details of how we build that in a second, but the point is every true row, right, we focus on the rows at which the formula is true, and we use that to form a particular phi i. We do it at every true row, and then we take the disjunction, right, so that, that gets you all the phi i's, and then you disjoin all of them. That gets you the disjunctive normal form. Okay, so I have now on the whiteboard here drawn the truth table of a particular example sentence. And now let's go through the algorithm to determine its equivalent disjunctive normal form. So it's not a contradiction. At least one row of the truth table is true. So we can do the interesting part of the algorithm, which is that I take this or it doesn't matter which one we start with, but might as well start at the top. So we take this row and we use it to construct our phi one. So phi one is going to be, it's gonna be a disjunction of some negatomics and um, I know in advance I'm only gonna need two of them, right? One for each of the atoms. What I'm going to do is in this row, Wherever the atom is assigned true, I simply copy the atom, so P1. And where it's false, I write its negation, so negation P2. And then correspondingly, right, phi2 is going to be coming from this row, and I'll write negation P1, conjunction P2, and then phi3, I write uh, negation P1, Conjunction, negation, P2. And then if we write down the uh, disjunction of phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, right? I'm being a little bit lazy by uh, not writing out the details of, right? Like in terms of P1 and P2. But I think it's clear what I mean here, right? If you basically just put this in place of P1 or phi 1, and likewise you put this in place of phi 2 and you put this in place of phi three, then that gets you the disjunctive normal form and it will be equivalent to the original sentence. And it's fairly clear that it'll be equivalent because uh, it will clearly be true at this row because we have effectively, you know, phi one is the clause which guarantee that will be true under, right, in this model. And, uh, and because we're taking disjunctions, right, if we're not in this, right, or, right the, I guess I should say, because all the other formulae are, or ever other components of this formula are formed with disjunctions, then uh, they don't matter, right? I mean, as, so, as soon as, uh, you know, if we have this model, since this sentence, uh, this subformula will be, true in this model and everything else is a disjunction, then the whole formula will be true in this model, just like uh, we have in the original formula.
And then likewise, right? When you're in this model, phi two will be true. And again, everything, uh, right? The phi's are disjoined. So that means the whole formula will, will be true and so on. Of course, uh, on this row, our disjunctive normal form will come out false because phi one, phi two, and phi three will all, uh, right? They are all so specified. So they are specified down to the assignments of all of the atoms that each one is guaranteed to come out false in this row because, right, because that row never actually got turned into a phi. So that, in a sense, that never got made true. And so it becomes false. And finally, we can discuss the conjunctive normal form. So just like every non-contradiction has an equivalent DNF, every non-tautology has an equivalent CNF. Uh, the algorithm is very similar. Uh, if it is a tautology, then its CNF is just a uh, verum. And otherwise, here's the algorithm, right? The algorithm uses the previous algorithm as a sub-protocol, so to speak. Here's what you do. First, look at the negation of your sentence, which is to say, just look at the rows in which the truth table is false. Use those to build your disjunctive normal form, right? So effectively what you're doing is you're getting the disjunctive normal form of the negation. So I've done that here in the whiteboard for this particular example. If you just use the rows at which the sentence is false, which is to say just the first row, you build the disjunctive normal form from those rows and you effectively have the disjunctive normal form of the negation from that procedure. Now, you negate that, right? Of course, if you negate that, you're now back to talking about phi, but you have a negation on the outside of a, dis, uh, of a disjunctive normal form. And if you push that disjunct, sorry, you push that negation into the disjunctive normal form and cancel double negations wherever they may arise, they didn't arise in this example, but if you had any double negations on your negatomics, then you would just cancel the double negations. And that would arrive at a conjunctive normal form. So this technically, technically, this is a conjunctive normal form. And in general, this algorithm will always arrive at a conjunctive normal form, even though here it maybe is hard to see why it is conjunctive normal form. But it is because, again, this is one of those border or edge cases where the number of conjuncts is equal to 1 and that conjunct is just this whole sentence, and this whole sentence is a disjunction of negatomics, so this is the conjunctive normal form. So, right, that's the algorithm for getting the conjunctive normal form for any sentence phi. Okay, next I want to talk about functional completeness, by which we mean the ability for any Boolean function to have an expression or a representation by a formula. So we've already said what it is for a formula to represent a, an n airy Boolean function. And so functional completeness would be sort of the ability for any function to find a formula representation. And this procedure shows that that always is possible because effectively, any n airy Boolean function basically just is a truth table. It just is filling in, right, you know, at, at every row, you make a choice about what goes here, and you make a choice about what goes here, and you make a choice, and you make a choice, and the choices that you make get you a truth table. And then you can use that truth table to construct the corresponding DNF, and that DNF will be, will represent, or uh, yeah, yeah, will represent the given n -airy Boolean function. And so this is a first and a relatively easy, but nice uh, because it is so easy, uh, example of a kind of completeness of expressive power. So, uh, right, we'll be kind of, this, this is sort of thematic of the sorts of things that we're interested in in mathematical logic. And finally, the book discusses a bunch of things about duality. Um, I'm not sure that I'll have much use for that in this video series, so I'm gonna skip it. I may fill this in later if I change my mind.